Well, we are here at nightclub and bar with Jim Morris. And you have an incredible story. So we, can, we gotta go all the way back to the very beginning, okay? You're partnered with another professional athlete with two different sports, hockey yes. and the NFL. So first of all, how did that even happen? Well, it's a, it's, it's a great story, is that Chris and I, I've been involved in his foundation, and uh, he's got the Chris Achilles Foundation, and we had become pretty good friends. And one night we were drinking together with another buddy, and we were drinking at competitors. And I looked at Chris and I said, "Hey, I really don't like this. I, I think it's it's not good. It's crap." And and he looked at me. He goes, "Well, we should do our own." And I happened to be buying a bunch of agave at the time for a, is a, for a, it's a substitute for fructose and sucrose. And I said, well, let's do it. And the next thing you know, we're on the trail to making our own, you know, world-class tequila. And uh, we came up with, you know, El Bandito Yankee. And it is truly, it's it's one of the best tequilas that you'll taste, uh, you know. Very smooth. And um, I also read you have a distiller Karina Rojo and how did you come to find her I mean you don't just you know, yeah. go down the, the no, Jalisco a, and go hey let's try to find a distiller no, What's that a, process yeah, like? that's actually a great question I appreciate you bringing it up is that um, what happened was uh, the distillery that we were working with um, with Juan Eduardo Nuez and uh, El Bieto um, he introduced us to her. She helped mastercraft this collection with us. And you're right. There's, I can tell you, there's only a couple of women in the entire industry that are master distillers, and especially in Mexico. And so, I think her story's great. We want to promote her as much as we can. But she has helped us develop, you know, truly a world-class tequila. I put ours up against anybody. I'll put her skill set up against anybody. I'm very, very proud of her. But she came along with the distillery and, you know, also kudos to Juan Eduardo for making her evolve into what she is. Yeah, she has quite the uh, background of, you know, her education, her acume in the business and that you have her uh, to, to create this. But I was also curious about the oxygenation process. Yeah. Is that unusual or is that typical? Well, the way we worked it is that to be tequila, it has to be distilled twice. That's, right. the, that's the law. And, um, and what happened is the molecular structure of, of alcohol, and I know this is a big exaggeration, but you get molecular components that are like this. And when you oxygenate it, it breaks them up into less biting, um, same alcohol content, but it's not that big bite that you get. And we wanted that broken down because I wanted to create a smooth experience for the people that were enjoying El Bandito. And so she would oxygenate it, we'd try it, she'd do it again, we'd try it. And we went through a process that, quite frankly, she moved very quickly and we got to what I, I preferred and what I think our, our collective team preferred, Chris Chilios as well, where we all like, hey, we looked at each other and go, that's it. And that's we got to that process through. You oxygenate in volume, whatever volume you have, you have a length of time that you, you create the oxygenation to get those bubbles to smooth out. And, and we worked for you know six months getting that you know perfected. And when I first heard about that, I was thinking of like how they put they pump bubbles in the wines and make them sparkling. So I've had a sparkling Shiraz. I said to myself, a sparkling tequila, but now I realize it's yeah. not sparkling. Yeah, it's we're just, just breaking the alcohol component down into smaller uh, bites, so you know, so it doesn't bite. But the, you know, the fact of it is, that our tequila. One of the things I'm very proud of. We wanted to go old school. We wanted to go traditional method. We wanted to be authentic. We had our tequila certified as 100% non-additives. Where's our competition out there? The big guys that are uh, that we're gonna, you know, unthrown. Right. You know. They're using additives and they're cheapening it up and so forth. And I didn't want to do that. I wanted people to have, hey, here's a real authentic, you know, 100 percent, you know, the Highland Blue Agave. Yeah, you're going to be able to taste the authenticity in our product, and, and that's really what I wanted to, you know, bring forward to people. Right. And it, even though this is such a high-end, ultra premium, the price points aren't that. Bad, are they? I, I don't know what the price point is. Yeah, are. we're going to be on our, our, our silver 
our Blanco will be at $39.99 and, and uh, we'll move it a, a couple yeah. dollars for our Reposado. And so, you know, we'll be competing against top shelf guys, but I can tell you this, we've taste tested against $100, $200 other tequilas and we've won out on it. And I'm very proud of that. I'm, I'm, I'm happy the fact that a $39.99 you know, Blanco can beat a hundred and eighty dollar, you know, or two hundred dollar, you know, That's competitor. wonderful. Yeah. It really is. And also we heard that there's actually a shortage of agave that now they're uh, planting blueberries instead of the agave plant. Yeah, are the, the agaves that? are the agave market's tied. It's a crop market and, yeah. and uh, they, they it, this year they planted a lot. I was just down there. I just uh, actually I just got back Wednesday from being down there at and at the distillery and, and looking at the crops and so forth. There's a lot that's been um, been planted for this next year and so forth but there's a lot of ground there and people are misled in regards to uh, what's going on in there. we're paying high high prices for agave uh, it's a situation where the the community is pretty affluent um, people people think of whatever get they get in their head and so forth but I can tell you that uh, everybody's everybody's working everybody's got a cell phone everybody's eating great and, and you know one of our deals was to make sure that that we were also giving back to, to the community down there. And so we've created a program with Sacred to, to we're looking for, hey, what can we do to, to help the people? Well, there's not much, because like I said, it's a pretty affluent area down there. It's not like anybody's taking advantage of them. I mean, at the prices, they everybody's well compensated down there in regards to the agave price levels. Can you uh, tell us what the acronym is for sacred what is the you know i'd have to go bring in i'd have to go bring in uh, our, our strategic officer for he can tell okay. me that is that but sacred was an organization we got introduced to that, that would help us in regards to any any of the cultural issues that we wanted to bring back to um uh, you know the, the the mexican culture down there and when i got introduced to him i said whatever you know would work and one of the one of my ideas was what happens because it's so affluent you get these young 13 14 year old kids that are making as much money as their dad and they go into an industry without seeing what other possibilities are out there and so i wanted to make sure that that we enlightened opportunities for for the for the, for the younger generation to see what else might be available so one of the things we were focusing on was to make sure everybody had a good internet access and could you know do some exploration with aspects and that's really where my focus was to make sure that the kids had an opportunity to expand well, that's really important. I think it's part of the process of getting back to the community that you're working in. And also, because you're supporting women and minorities in your business, um, do you think that having this uh, Carina Rojo as an example to maybe in, uh, to encourage other young people to, yeah, with their education and to move forward, not to become necessarily a master distiller, but to increase the education awareness. Yes, I have a, we have a facility called the Morris Family Multicultural Center that I developed at my university at Kansas State. And I'm Native American, and so uh, we built this multicultural center to for the inclusion and, and the diversity aspects. And I'm a big believer of, of building bridges for people to get them from this point to the next point. And that cultural center was, was just one example of the things that we do. So we take that and apply that across all of our, our business operations. We're one of the, we're one of the largest uh, minority business enterprises in the United States in regards to our, our, the various sectors, whether it's packaging. Morse Packaging is, is, is the leading minority business in that area, uh, whether it's ingredients, Heartland Supply Company, another the biggest, you know, as far as minority owned, and when we deal with the biggest corporations in America, whether it's Costco or Walmart or Cargill or Tyson, it doesn't matter. But but we've shown and, and you know demonstrated that minority businesses and once you know you get an opportunity, they can thrive. And so I took that. We bring the same concept to individuals, so we can bridge them from where they're at here and move them into a, a, a you know hopefully a, a more prosperous direction. Well, I think that's why you have such an outstanding product because you bring that integrity and that spirit of giving back. And we uh, we have tried the product; it's it's beautiful. No, and I appreciate it. Thank yeah, you very so much. Yeah. I appreciate you guys trying uh, oh, well, El Bandito and enjoying it. We really, really did, and we want to thank, thank you for your for time and to get to know your product a yeah, thank and you yourself. Guys. I appreciate it so much. You Thanks for having me. The other one too that we tried the first time. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, thank, thank you. you. Thank you so much. Appreciate it. Okay.